It's Tuesday, March 12th here in Seoul, and you've tuned in to the midday edition of Arirang News. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Lee Ji-yoon. And here are the top stories at this hour. Wrapping up his stay in Brunei, President Moon Jae-in is now heading to Malaysia with hopes of boosting bilateral ties and winning support for his drive for peace on the Korean Peninsula. A top U.S. negotiator says diplomacy is still very much alive between North Korea and the U.S. and that Washington is open to talks with North Korea on denuclearization despite the collapsed Hanoi summit last month. The cabinet reviews and deliberates on a number of bills today, including ones related to promoting eco-friendly cars, as well as protecting personal data stored by global IT companies. Currently on a three-nation tour in ASEAN, President Moon Jae-in is now headed for Malaysia after wrapping up his three-day state visit to Brunei. Our Shin Zemin starts us off. During his three-day stay in Brunei, President Moon Jae-in stressed how South Korea's relations with the country have steadily progressed over the years since the two sides established diplomatic ties in 1984. And Sultan Hassan al-Bolkiah threw his support behind President Moon's new southern policy that hopes to shore up economic and diplomatic relations between Seoul and the 10 member states of ASEAN, including Brunei. Acknowledging that both countries focus on improving people's lives, President Boon and the Sultan agreed to work on measures that are reciprocal and complementary. The leaders also agreed to start working on an LNG value chain that covers everything from gas mine development to transportation and sales. They also promised to work together on renewable energy under the East Asia Summit Corporation. And the two agreed to promote bilateral ties in areas of intellectual property and amp up social exchanges. With the curtain coming down on his stay in Brunei, President Boon will zero in on the economy in Malaysia. The South Korean leader will attend a Hallyu and Halal exhibition and hold summit talks with the Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad, which will be followed by the signing of an MOU and then a joint press conference. South Korea's presidential office says the leaders hope to widen the scope of their bilateral relations, including in the areas of information communication technology and artificial intelligence. Having secured promises of cooperation on multiple fronts and also having won full backing for his peace drive on the Korean Peninsula from one of the major ASEAN member nations, President Boon and the entourage of business leaders will head to Kuala Lumpur, where he will push for stronger economic ties with Malaysia. Shin Se-min, Arirang News, Bandara City, Begawan. South Korea appears to be working hard behind the scenes to keep the inter-Korean peace drive on track, despite last month's disappointing summit in Hanoi. Seoul's top security advisor Chung eui yong reportedly traveled to China last weekend for a meeting with the country's top diplomat Yang Jiechi. Sources say the two discussed a North Korea-U.S. summit and possible follow-up measures. And Zhang was reportedly due to hold a phone conversation with his U.S. counterpart John Bolton on Monday evening Korea time. Earlier, Bolton told ABC News that he will be speaking with Zhang over the latest satellite images that showed the regime could be rebuilding its missile launch site. And the Blue House has yet to confirm whether the call actually happened. A U.S. State Department official has said there will likely be another summit between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, although no date has been set. According to Reuters, U.S. Undersecretary of State Andrea Thompson made the comments at the Carnegie Nuclear Conference on Monday. She says President Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo have been very clear that the two sides remain open to dialogue and that they are working to hold another meeting. But Thompson also said the U.S. will keep its pressure campaign on until North Korea Korea gives up its nuclear weapons. So despite the summit breakdown in Hanoi, Washington's special envoy in North Korea says diplomacy continues with North Korea, but that the U.S. will not accept partial denuclearization. Our Park Kijun reports. U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Stephen Began says dialogue with Pyongyang is very much alive. 
Well, let me start by saying uh, uh, the obvious, that diplomacy is still very much alive. And uh, while we haven't uh, made as much progress in the six months as I would have hoped uh, coming in on the first day, uh, we stay uh, closely engaged uh, with our counterparts in North Korea. Speaking at a nuclear conference hosted by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on Monday, Beacon said President Trump is open to another meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. But putting forward an all-or-nothing approach, he said the U.S. is not going to do denuclearization incrementally. He insists that the North has to remove all its weapons of mass destruction, including its chemical and biological weapons. According to Beacon, President Trump hopes to achieve it before his first term ends in January 2021. When the North finishes the process of complete denuclearization, Beacon said that's when the U.S. will lift the economic sanctions. As for recent reports on new activity at the Tongchangli test sites, Beacon says Washington is closely monitoring the rocket sites. He said he did not know whether the North Korean leader would decide to launch another missile, but he reiterated President Trump would be disappointed if Kim were to resume nuclear testing. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. And for the first time since the Hanoi summit broke down two weeks ago, North Korea has publicly stated that it's still up for complete denuclearization. The regime's propaganda outlet Uri Minjokiri reported on Tuesday that North Korea firmly wants to establish new relations with the U.S., bring peace to the Korean peninsula, and move towards completely abandoning its nuclear arsenal. The report also implied the North will keep communicating with the U.S. A separate propaganda outlet, DPRK Today, released the same report. Now, these outlets aren't considered as official as state-run media like the Korean Central News Agency or the Rodong Shinmun, but the reports are still grabbing attention as they are the first to show North Korea's stance about denuclearization since the Hanoi summit. The United States thinks it has clearly told North Korea what it wants and that the ball is now in Pyongyang's court and Washington is waiting for the regime to define a stance on future negotiations. That's according to South Korea's ambassador to the United States, Cho yun jae on Monday. Cho said right now it's better for North Korea and the U.S. to slow down, analyze the results of the summit and plan the best way forward. He added it's true there was disappointment about the summit breaking down, but stressed Pyongyang and Washington will be able to have advanced negotiations from now as they have a clear idea of what each side wants. Despite being weighed down by tough sanctions, a new UN report shows that Pyongyang might be dodging those sanctions through illegal transactions. Our Lee Seung jae has more. According to a report to the UN Security Council by a panel of international experts expected to be issued this week, North Korea has found a chink in the armor of the sanctions placed on the regime. The report says North Korea has been accelerating its imports of petroleum products through illicit ship-to-ship -ship transfers while stepping up its coal exports. The report also indicates Pyongyang has been illegally exporting small arms to Syria, Yemen, Libya and Sudan. The UN plans to investigate possible companies and individuals in Asia who have been aiding North Korea by secretly purchasing centrifuges for its uranium enrichment. The report said it's through these transactions that North Korea is able to continue its uranium enrichment process. Despite what seems to be easing tensions between North Korea and the U.S., Pyongyang is maintaining its defense readiness, dispersing missile-related facilities in case of U.S. military action. The report says Pyongyang's Sunan International Airport is reported to be one of the facilities. The Wall Street Journal says the report also includes information that North Korea is involved in cyber attacks and virtual monetary hijacking targeting foreign financial institutions. The UN report is published twice a year to evaluate the implementation and effectiveness of sanctions against North Korea. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. The United States has reiterated to local financial institutions for the first time this year to be extra careful avoiding financial transactions with North Korea. 
According to Voice of America on Tuesday, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, a bureau of the U.S. Treasury Department, issued the advisory last Friday. The advisory included that the Financial Action Task Force, an intergovernmental organization, remains concerned about the regime's money laundering schemes and the serious threat they pose to the integrity of the international financial system. The Treasury Department emphasized that the U.N. has adopted a number of resolutions implementing economic sanctions against North Korea. South Korea and the U.S. are expected to complete their new Tongmeng joint military exercise today. The computer-simulated command post exercise began last Monday, meaning alliance in English, Tongmeng focuses on defense contingency mechanisms. Now, earlier this month, Seoul's Defense Minister Chung kyung do and Acting U.S. Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan decided to put an end to the two-week-long key resolve exercise and kickstart the new scaled-down Tongmeng exercise in efforts to support diplomacy with North Korea. The presidential office, government and ruling party officials have agreed to establish a national education committee under the presidential office by the end of this year. The committee will be tasked with drawing up 10-year plans for South Korea's education system. The committee will consist of 19 members, five chosen by the president, eight by the National Assembly, and six by related ministries. They'll serve three-year terms regardless of a change in government. The National Assembly will submit a related bill to the floor by April. They hope it'll win approval before the first half of this year. The floor leader of the main opposition Liberty Korea Party, Na Gyeong Won, slammed the Moon administration's economic and defense policies on Tuesday. During a speech as the leader of the one of the parliament's negotiating blocs, Na criticized the current administration's income-led growth policy and employment record. She claimed the policy is a violation of the Constitution because it removes the public's economic quote-unquote freedom. She suggested a roundtable conference of economic experts to come up with practical policies to help the sluggish economy. Now also attacked government's policies on North Korea, saying that the ending of the three joint ROK U.S. military exercises seriously threatens national security. When she said that President Moon seems to be acting as North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's chief spokesperson, there was strong protest from other parties, with some members shouting and leaving the chamber. Ruling Party floor leader Hong Yong-pyo condemned Na's statement, saying that the Democratic Party will not tolerate such words and will take strong action against it. The South Korean government is stepping up efforts to promptly review amendments and bills accelerating deregulation while better protecting the public's personal data. Our Kim ji has the story. Various bills related to the economy and people's livelihoods were reviewed and deliberated upon on Tuesday at the 10th cabinet meeting presided over by Prime Minister Lee na -gyun. They included allowing the installation of charging stations for hydrogen vehicles near commercial or residential areas as part of efforts to promote the use of eco-friendly cars. The prime minister also expressed his appreciation to the local taxi and private carpooling industries that reached a resolution last week. It's been the result of communication and concessions by both sides. It will serve as an exemplary precedent for similar cases in the future. Other agenda items included regulations that will make it harder for private schools to fire or penalize staff members without reasonable cause, as well as measures to tackle sexual harassment. Also, amendments to strengthen the protection of personal data stored by global IT giants, which have servers overseas, such as Google, Facebook and Apple, were also discussed. Under proposals, the companies could be fined up to 18,000 U.S. dollars if they don't designate a local representative to deal with the matter. Kim ji Arirang News. A delegation from the IMF has expressed concern over the pace of minimum wage hikes in South Korea. In a meeting with Finance Minister Hong Nam-gi on Monday, IMF's Chief Korea Chief, Taruhan Fejioglu, also said that labor market flexibility needs to be strengthened. He added that raising the potential economic growth rate with expansionary fiscal and monetary policies is important to address a domestic and external economic crisis. South Korea's minimum wage was hiked by double percentage 
point digits on a year in 2018 and 2019 and currently stands at 7 U.S. dollars and 40 cents an hour. So our metropolitan government is adding to its fleet of rescue helico helicopters, bringing in a new multifunctional helicopter that can provide medical care and help put out fires. The Leonardo AW189 helicopter will carry EMS kits, including respirators and def defibrillators, and is equipped with thermal observation and meteorological radar equipment so it can provide treatment during the night. And its water bucket can hold up to 2,000 liters of water to help extinguish fires. The chopper can carry up to 18 people and stay in the air for over four hours, and it begins operations on Tuesday. Multiple airlines have suspended using Boeing's 737 MAX 8 aircraft after Sunday's crash in Ethiopia that killed everyone on board. Our Adam has the latest. Ethiopia, China, Indonesia and a host of other nations have grounded the new version of Boeing's best-selling aircraft. This comes after questions were raised about the 737 MAX 8's safety. Sunday's crash in Ethiopia was very similar to last October's deadly crash of the same model in Indonesia. Safety experts, however, cautioned against drawing too many comparisons between the two crashes until more is known. The cause of Sunday's disaster is not yet clear, but the investigators found the jetliner's two flight recorders. Ethiopian authorities are leading the investigation into the crash, assisted by the U.S., Kenya and others. Despite the safety concerns, Boeing said it had no reason to pull the popular aircraft from the skies. The firm plans to send a technical team to the crash site to help investigators. The incident has caused Boeing's share prices to tumble. The loss of the Chinese market is especially a big blow to the U.S.-based firm as the country is one of Boeing's biggest customers. Meanwhile, Korea's transport ministry has also started to inspect the new 737 model. The ministry is working with a local budget carrier E-Star Jet, which operates two MAX 8 planes on routes to Japan and Thailand. Korean Air, T-Way and other Korean carriers are looking at whether they should go ahead with importing the jetliners. No Adam, Adirang News. To get to the root causes of sexual abuse and human rights violations in sports, the Sports Reform Forum launched on Tuesday. Our Won Jung-hwan has more. Sexual violence in the sports community has been a major issue in South Korea after athletes, including Olympic gold winner skater Shim seok -hee, spoke out about sexual assaults. And to try to address the issue, the National Assembly has created the Sports Reform Forum. Some 50 political figures, former athletes and experts held a launch ceremony for the forum on Tuesday morning. The forum will meet once a month to work out measures to improve human rights in sports. As Korean society has long been placing scores and medal counts as the central values in sports, the issue of human rights violation and sexual abuse has finally surfaced among athletes. We have now come at a time where we cannot be silent when facing those issues. At the forum, the speakers described how the apprenticeship-like training system that the nation's top young athletes have to endure creates an environment where athletes are vulnerable to abuse. Meanwhile, Korea's human rights watchdog began its largest ever investigation into sexual abuse in sports earlier this year. It aims to address the systematic, sustained abuse in sports, which had been hushed up for generations by victims afraid of being banished from their sports. These efforts aim to bring much-needed reform to the sports environment and stamp out abuse of athletes once and for all. Won Jong-won, Arirang News. Well, the 2019 KBO Baseball League starts next week, and to get ready for the new season, the players will have practice games over the next eight days. And there are also some new regulations and changes for the upcoming season. Our Sabobin has more. Before the upcoming 2019 KBO Professional Baseball League, the preseason practice games will begin Tuesday and continue until Wednesday next week. These practice games will all begin at 1 p.m. local time on Tuesday in five stadiums across the country. Each team will play a total of eight games, and should a game get canceled due to rain or high levels of fine dust, it won't be rescheduled. D1 
These games are a chance for teams to improve their tactics and get an insight on their opponent's strengths and weaknesses. Also, 19 of the league's 30 foreign players will be making their Korean baseball debut. The KBO League has made some changes for this season. These include a new official ball that is 1 mm larger and 1 gram heavier than before. There will also be a new rule banning runners from rough sliding to reach base. This rule comes in due to several severe injuries caused by rough sliding. Fielders will also have to step on base correctly. The criteria for canceling games due to fine dust has been specified. Starting this season, if there is a fine dust warning issued, the game can be canceled one hour before the start of the game. After the preseason games end next Wednesday, the six-month-long official KBO League will start next Saturday. Sobobin, Arirang News. With South Korea set to become the first country in the world to launch 5G services for all local customers, service providers showed how fast how the super-fast mobile network can also be used to advance driverless car technology. Our Oh Si-young tells us more. Driving in 5G has become a reality on the streets of Seoul. On Monday, A1, a driverless car developed by Hanyang University, successfully drove 8 kilometers in eastern Seoul using the next-generation 5G mobile network. It's the first time in the world that a self-driving vehicle has used 5G to drive on public roads among human drivers. Powered by mobile carrier LG U+, the vehicle was able to switch lanes, swerve around obstacles and stream live footage of its journey without bugs or delays. Current LTE systems make it difficult to pinpoint the exact location of the car due to delays of around 600 milliseconds. 5G can reduce this margin of error within 30 milliseconds. This revolutionary speed is expected to contribute greatly to the development of driverless vehicles. LGU Plus and Hanyang University's ACE Lab also plan to add 5G-based entertainment, including VR and AR content, to create a multi-dimensional travel experience. Using 5G's high-speed connectivity and the ultra-low latency, other network carriers are also showcasing the technology. KT Corporation earlier this year test drove a 10-seater 5G-equipped bus in the heart of the Korean capital. Each of the bus's seats comes with a VR headset, so passengers can find themselves among the cheering crowd at a baseball stadium, a K-pop concert or at an amusement park with a virtual date. Once driverless cars start hitting the road, passengers will have more time on their hands. So there will be a huge demand for infotainment content using 5G to process massive amounts of data in ultra-high speed. Given Korea's plentiful bandwidth and infrastructure to enable 5G-based driving, it's no longer just a question of technological viability. As driverless cars get closer to commercialization by the day, service providers are now racing to provide optimized media services to win over customers. Oh Si-young, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Strong winds will blow in this afternoon and clear away the dust in the air. But brace yourself for a brief sprinkled snap starting this afternoon. And tomorrow morning, we could wake up to lows going down to below zero here in the capital. And it's going to feel colder than the actual temperatures. So let's dress warmly. Meanwhile, many inland regions will receive light showers of less than 5 millimeters during the day, while parts of Gangwon province could see flurries of snow. And daily highs will be similar to slightly lower than yesterday, getting up to 9 degrees here in the capital and over in Chuncheon, but Gyeongju and Jeju will be mild, topping out at 17 degrees this afternoon. Now tomorrow and on Thursday morning, we will wake up to sub-zero temperatures, while well, a mix of rain and snow is in the forecast for Friday. And also beware of big temperature differences for the time being. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
And that brings us to the end. We'll be back at 4 p.m. Korea time with the latest updates and more, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching and goodbye.